this time of year that we barely have time to think, let alone plan or breathe. If you're anything like me, you've even started to look at those Black Friday advertisements that have come out and you've begun to kind of coordinate your attack for that insanely hectic celebration of consumerism that we have. You know, personally, the Best Buy ad is the one that I usually spend the most time with. I like the gadgets and computers and, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time with it and then we never seem to have time to make it there on Friday. Uh, I'll have to try and figure that one out sometime. The question that I found myself asking as I wrote this message is, why? Why do we do this to ourselves every year? We make ourselves miserable planning events for others to enjoy. And we spend more time planning to enjoy that season than we do actually enjoying it. I ask you, what kind of sense does that make? And it's not just that either. We jam pack our regular schedules full of work and errands, for some of us, even sleep. I can't believe I live in an age where I actually can say I know people that schedule sleep into their calendars so that they remember to actually get some. You know, we, we work like, like honeybees, driving ourselves constantly until we die. I read that scripture today um, for a friend of mine last night at work, and uh, he proceeded to comment about how depressing it is. You know, do what you want. It doesn't matter. We're all going to die in the end, he said. And I can kind of see how he gets that. You know, in verse 3, for example, and I'll just kind of warn you, I used a totally different translation to write the sermon than I did to read it just now. <laughs> it says, our fate comes to all alike. And this is as wrong as anything that happens in this world. As long as people live, their minds are full of evil and madness, and suddenly they die. Ecclesiastes refers to our lives as meaningless, as pointless, and our efforts to work in this life is futile. At first read, it's extremely depressing and an incredibly sad book of the Bible. And you start to suspect that the writer probably could have benefited with some antidepressants and a little bit of therapy. But luckily, as, uh, as many times in the Bible, it's, that's not the end. In verse 7, we read, Go ahead, eat your food, and be happy. Drink your wine, be cheerful. It's all right with God. It's easy to read that with just a, a hint of sarcasm and a, a bit of cynicism. I mean, he spent most of the book, aside from maybe chapter 2, where it tells us that there's a time for every season under heaven. You know, the, the birds took that, and we think it's great. But everything else is talking about how death is just kind of going to be there. There's no point. And so it's easy to look at it with, with just that little bit of sarcasm. I mean, why the sudden rosy outlook, right? Unless what he's saying isn't about death being sad or depressing, just acknowledging it as an inevitable state for every being on this rock that we call home. You can look at that and you can be down, or you can see it as a call to life, a call to, to carpe diem, to seize the day, if you want to use that you know, now famous cliche, uh, to living each moment to the fullest, planning less and opening yourself for God just a little bit more. In recent generations, we've kind of given up the ability to be flexible in exchange for a more structured, settled life. We work and we work just to make a living and, and gather the things that make this life a little bit more comfortable. We miss children's milestones, like their first steps, their first words, dance recitals and plays. We miss those moments when our loved ones need, uh, need us to take care of us, shoulder to cry on, last breaths, last words. For better or for worse, we've begun to experience life through pictures and videos instead of actually experiencing life. We don't think much of it because, well, we can see it on our cell phones and our smartphones and live streamed via the internet. So very few of us actually take time to, to actually live. We've even taken to videotaping live events. I don't know how many concerts I've been to where I've seen the person with their phone like this and they're watching the concert through the screen of their phone instead of actually watching the concert live in front of them, you know? And then they never go back and look at that concert. They don't ever look at the film. They missed everything that was live for no good reason. We've allowed ourselves to become less like the disciples who dropped everything 
and followed Jesus, and more like the Jewish leader that was mentioned in, in Luke, who asked Jesus, what, what do I have to do to follow you? And it turned out that he was just too rich and attached to his life. He, he couldn't, couldn't just go and follow. He was looking for an answer from Jesus that would fit into his schedule. Verse 12 tells us that you never know when your time is coming. Like birds suddenly caught in a trap, fish caught in a net, we're trapped at some evil moment when we least expect it. It's a theme that's repeated throughout the Bible. You know, like a thief in the night, no one knows the time, etc., etc., so forth. Even those that know they're going to die are still surprised when it happens. There are so many stories of terminally ill people that have beaten a short prognosis that it's nearly impossible to count. My, uh, my grandfather, you know, he was initially given five years to live from cancer, and he managed to stretch that out a long time. There are other people that are told they have a long time, and then they manage to not stretch that out quite so much. Um, but it's not knowing when we will die, but that eventually we will that separates us from other animals. It's what we do with that knowledge that we're going to die that matters. Many of us would rather mourn our impending end than face it fearlessly, knowing that we've lived a full life that God had intended. We look at death with, with fear and trepidation instead of welcoming it, knowing that we finished this life as best we could and that now it's time to go on to bigger and brighter and better things. I think it's time that we re-examine our lives. Or better yet, let God examine our lives. Give him a chance to uh, kind of free up some of our time. And then give that newly acquired free time over to him. Let it fill him with, with his goals for us. You know, make yourself available to put down your net and follow him. I mean, can you imagine how different the New Testament would have been if Jesus had walked up to the disciples on the shore and, and he had said, put down your nets, go home, get your affairs in order, and uh, let's say we meet back here in about a week. <laughs> it would have been a completely different story. Instead of just put down your nets and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they did. They said... Okay, sure, why not? I don't like fishing anyways. <laughs> it's a guarantee that we'll live fuller lives, filled with experiences that we never would have had if, if we hadn't let him arrange them for us. Now, I didn't say good experiences. I just said experiences. I just want to go ahead and clarify that really quick. But beyond that individual call, I believe it's important to view this passage as a metaphor for our church. Sadly, the church as we know it is slowly dying. It's easy to ignore, but it's something that we can't afford to. I had a job as a lay ministry coordinator uh, for First Lutheran Church. It's just down the street. And we had a problem that's afflicting many churches today, the aging church population. Our volunteers had been doing those jobs forever, and they were burnt out and then we couldn't find people to fill the vacancies. It seems that our church fits in, into the average schedule once or twice a week, maybe. For some, it's more like once or twice a year. The guys that come to uh, Christmas, and they come to Easter, and yeah, you have no clue who they are. They're on the rolls, they're not visitors, <laughs> but they might as well be. Like ourselves, we pack the, the schedule of the church full of things. We look at the building, and though we may reach into the community once in a while, we've become too rigid to serve them effectively. We are too inflexible to adapt to the changing dynamics of the society around us. I told your mom I was going to wind up doing the sermon with you. <laughs> We've become too rigid to serve them effectively, too, inf too inflexible to adapt to the changing dynamics of the society that's around us. The church no longer lives in the moment. We instead expect those moments to
to revolve around us. We must realize that the church must change to allow people to live in the moment and participate in the body of Christ. I know change can be a dirty word to some churches, but it's what must happen. And so the challenge to us is to open ourselves up, to stand up, to stretch, make ourselves more flexible to the moments that God gives us in life, and then to use that newfound flexibility and think of a way that you can affect change in the church so that it exists in the moments of the people and can serve once again as a beacon to the community, not just of hope, not just of love, but also of life.